Well, Tim, uh, thank you for allowing us to come into your beautiful new home here in Tavernier. Um, obviously, we've been doing this podcast collecting stories from icons and Hall of Famers, and we would not ever even come close to being complete without having you on this podcast. Yeah, well, thank, I mean, I mean, we went to war for so many years. <laughs> I did. mean, take a look at your success down here. You know, it's so profound. You're the only angler to win the traditional old school invitational tournaments, which were the two bonefish tournaments and the two fly tournaments, the Don Holly and the Gold Cup, fall fly, the spring fly. You're the only one that's, that's won those. And there are only a handful that have won all three tarpon tournaments. Um, but you're, you're so prolific, not only as, um, as an angler and a tournament angler back in the day, but now you've evolved into being a, a great guide. Uh, and so hopefully we can cover a little bit about the spectrum because um, of your success and, and the level of your success. Um, and with that being said, we interviewed uh, Sandy Moret this last year. And I think the, the holy grail, if you will, or the one that was most profound for a long time and possibly still today was the Gold Cup. And uh, when you won it, you set the highest, uh, I think you still have the record for the most points in the Gold Cup. And when I asked Sandy Moretta a year ago, what was it like for you to win the Gold Cup? And he just started crying. Hmm. Um, what, in your eyes, was the, your biggest success besides the amount of wins? Yeah, well, it's good to see you guys and have you here. And my home and and uh i was thinking about this when you were coming that you know andy we competed for years and i don't think we ever talked hardly at all like hey you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> right uh, i didn't i just didn't really speak to my competitors that much i wasn't antisocial. it was just within myself and and i think you were a little bit the same way but uh we've spent more time talking in the last month than we have in, in the last 20 years, years right right but uh, so, yeah, it's great to have you. And um, yeah, so there's so many great memories um, fishing highs and over the years. And certainly the Gold Cup is is uh, is probably the biggest that week is um, it's so intense. It's so much hard work. It's so much preparation that goes into it. And and then to have a week like we had, um, which was so special with my best friend, Rick Murphy and you know, the guy who was the best man at my wedding and introduced me to my wife. And, wow. um, and we, you know, accomplished so many great things together. Um, to have that kind of week was, uh, was really, really special. It was a lot of fun. Well, I remember, too, it's just like you didn't fish a lot of tarpon tournaments, but every time we had terrible weather, and I remember it might have been the first time you fished the Golden Fly, it was like a hurricane, tropical storm. <laughs> we're was. anchored up. And we're like hanging out under uh, under anything we can hide under. It was unfishable, and you came in with a one thirty five. Yeah, it's like, how the hell do you guys do this? That's and, a story and, in and, itself. And, and, but... and Murphy was just such a great bad weather backcountry guide. I mean, he was magical, right? Yeah, yeah we. Well, so you're right. I didn't fish. Um, I I just couldn't afford to fish uh, three tournaments a year. Right. I could fish. I could literally, uh, and I really couldn't afford it. I was, you know, fishing outside of my means. The Calcutta was actually really important to me um, to help pay for, you know, pay for the ride. But it was always just one tar tarpon tournament and and, uh, and two bonefish tournaments a year. And I would, you know, kind of budget for that and budget the practice around that. Um, but yeah, Rick, Rick could put you on the fish. I mean, the gold, the gold cup win. We had perfect weather, perfect tides for the whole week. Five days of just except the first day. First day was tough. If you remember that year, it rained and it was cloudy, but, and we had four incredible, incredible days. The golden fly was blowing 35 to 40 out of the East for three straight days, crystal clear, crystal clear skies. Um, and Rick, I don't know if you know his reputation, but he runs the boat like, like he's going to kill you. Right. I mean, he's a madman running the boat and we always had our boats, I mean, I, I had I saw 61 on my Mirage uh, with the 115 two-stroke Yamaha on it. Yeah, 61 that on a, in, a, in a 17 Mirage is is really fast, and that was at that time. It's nothing like Dustin today and right. those guys. But the Widowmaker. Yeah, that's not. I mean, now that's you're, you're left in the dust. But right. 
back then that was a really, really fast boat. And Rick did all kinds of things. He, you know, he greased the sides with some sp special spray and he, we used to play with the weight, you know, where we would put the weight on the boat and, and I would ride behind him F 15 style, like, you know, guy aerodynamically, guy. it was a one sound. mile an hour. We, we would get one mile an hour for, by me being behind him versus beside him. Did you test that? We tested that. Dude, that there was wow. just all kinds of things. You know, put all the weight from the front of the boat into the back of the boat, everything. And then when we get to the spot, move everything front, you know, to, for the noise. So uh, that golden fly, he almost killed us. I mean, uh, he wouldn't say that, but we were going across from uh, Conkey, you know, towards the Cape. And... Uh, I was just scared. I, I mean, I, that was probably the scaredest I've ever been on a boat. And we, we took off into the air and we came down and buried the left side of the bow, literally at full speed like that. And I thought it was it and uh, pulled right out of it. He kept he pushed we harder. We didn't speak for about 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Not a word was spoken, but uh, we got over there and, and um, we, we got to a spot and, and uh, Glenn Flutie will love me telling the story. He, he and, uh, Tom Siska pulled up in front of us and Rick's like, well, I'm not going to have any of that. So Rick goes up there and you know, we, they got into this spot discussion and who should be where. And it was two people over there. It's just us, two of us. And Rick lost the, the argument. And um, so we went back to our spot behind him and it wasn't, but 20 minutes later, here comes a big head wake. And I caught that one, 130, 130, 135 couple more releases and the rest of it and that was his history won that tournament so, so it was kind of, kind of funny it was like behind glenn after we had this argument and beautiful yeah so what was so special about rick he just he, in, in in bad conditions he just knew where they hunkered down and he, he was a really good bad weather fisherman correct he, i i think he is he won um he won the gold cup with steve ward also in in a bad, bad weather. weather week so he's really uh he's really good all over the back and particularly, you know, when it gets bad, there's places in the rivers, uh, in oyster in whitewater places where you can go and get out of the, that bad weather and, and still catch fish. And, you know, they, they grinded it out back there and, uh, you know, got another victory. Also you too, know. let's not forget that the Cape is on the lee side of the Eastern, you know, predominant wind <laughs> that typically blows at 30. So it's kind of calm there. And that was so important to have a fast boat to be there, everybody. And that's when yeah. all these guys, I think that's when they, I don't know, they were racing to the pocket, even, you know, in their 70s, you yeah. know, big 200 horsepower boats to get to the pocket, which wasn't very far away. But the Gold Cup typically was some sort of a boat race at some point. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, and now it's even higher speeds. Yeah. And especially with the ocean being the predominant spot that people seem to be fishing and winning. You know, there's a few, obviously, a few coveted spots that people want to get to, and that speed is is so important. Right. We, there's a, I have a great pocket story in the Gold Cup. Um, so we day t day two, we caught a release on the first day, and day two we went over there and caught a 155, and then the out of the pocket. Oh, in no, the no, cape, in the cape. Yeah, and um, I think that's the biggest fish ever caught in a Gold Cup. I think Brewer and 155 and a half and Brewer, I think caught a 155 with Baker, but. I think I got a 150 or one somewhere in there, but I don't yeah. know if it was 55, you know. Big. I don't know, but it was. They're but all big. They're, but not, I don't think anything's bigger than 155 that's been caught that I know yeah. of. Yeah, so we got clouded out and we were on the way back to the ocean. And we're going past Buchanan Lake and we looked over in the pocket and it was middle mid fall and there was nobody there. Like nobody. The whole bank. We're like, the hell? You know, something happened in the this world, is, it, it, you know, so well, we'll pull in there. Why not try the pocket? We pull in. When we pull in, there's a mullet mud that was taken up the whole basin. It was on the bank. You could hardly even see where the bank was. And it was out into the lake. And you it was literally like chocolate, that kind of mullet mud. Right. And uh, and then it kind of dawned on us, OK, people can't see. So they, they pulled in, saw the mud and they can't see. So. Rick said, hey, this is right up our alley. We're used to fishing in the mud. So we pull in, we get in the pocket, and, and uh, I'm standing there staring into the mud, and all of a sudden I see, you know, a little one goes sliding by, like 20 feet from me. I'm like, oh, okay. They're here. I, I can see them. I just have to adjust my thinking of where I'm at. and Right. Because it's never muddy there, right? I mean, it's, right. you know, 
I can't ever, ever think of it being muddied up. And, uh, and then another one slid by and I didn't even get the cast off, you know? And so I'm starting to adjust to think, you know, and I, I changed, I had a, you know, pocket fly on and I changed to a, a black and purple, like I would be Cape fly, yeah, Cape fly, yeah. you know? And, and, uh, and then I saw him coming from 40 feet and throughout and catch a 92 <laughs> in the pocket, you right. know, to add to the 155. Yeah. So yeah, everything guys cut. We're, we're just monsters. Yeah. Um, a lot of the people, I mean, we've got anglers from like 87 countries that are keying into these conversations and the stories that are being told. And I mm-hmm. think that, uh, you know, it's important for the people to understand that we're talking about all these really important tournaments here in the Florida Keys. But a lot of these stories that are told, too, can be applicable elsewhere, you know, whether we're fishing clear water or muddy water. And two, being in competitions, it's similar, but it's so different. A fishing competition, it's a contrast in words. But it's amazing the fevered pitch that this place turns into, you know, that week in, in, uh, in June. I was going to ask, was there any animosity between you guys? I mean, you said you guys no, never talked. You know, no, I love these guys. I remember when you yeah. first won your tournament, I've always really appreciated and respected you and Croca, and I knew that before you made your first win, you were always in contention, but you hadn't won yet. When you first won, I was really happy for you guys. The was, first fall fly I fished in, you won. That 97 That tournament. was 97. That was the first year I fished it with Dwayne Baker. Right. And, uh, you know, fishing a tournament like that – I was just kind of an outsider, like fishing. A, I'd fished a couple of Seamasters and a couple of little things, but this was the first real major tournament that I fished in. So I, that was your first tournament too? It was. It was my, my first fall it, fly. It was my first major tournament period, if anything. I'd you know? fished the spring fly that spring. That was my first. So the first fall fly I fished was my, was my second tournament. Okay. But I was with the great Harry Spear. Yeah. And I was like you, I was like so innocent, like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, shy, where, where do you want me to throw it? You know, right. I, you know, walk softly and don't let the guy carry the big stick. Yeah. But, um, I don't know where I was going to go with that, but, but, oh, you're talking about animosity. So there was really nothing. I think that you really focused a little bit more on the bonefish tournaments, and I was more focused on the tarpon tournaments. And Hoover and I were basically a couple of tarpon guys just trying to get lucky in a bonefish tournament, you know, where he had really refined guides. Right. You know, I think Hoover would admit this, but when we were talking to so is that is that Coca, your is that your excuse why you haven't won more bonefish tournaments? Is it your guy? No, I sucked. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> so, no, but um, you probably just didn't put in the time. Well, we didn't fish bonefish, right? You know, so it was interesting speaking with Croca on the podcast. He was saying that yeah, we'd go here, we'd go there, and at the end of the day, we'd get twenty shots. And you were telling me you had like fifteen or twenty shots, and we'd get like four, and hopefully catch a fish. And you know, so we were completely, you know, over our head competing against guys like this because they were refined bone fishermen. Croco was there every day. You were there every day. We were committed to it. Yeah. I mean, that's a big difference and a big advantage, you know, to have a guide and an angler. I mean, you can have one or the other. Typically it would be just the guide, right? That would, that would be a, somebody who's committed to bone fishing, but you know, Dwayne Baker and I, or, or Mark Croco and I were just perfect fits committed to bone fishing. Right. And crazy about it and loved it. And, and we're able to refine it and the techniques and how we did it. And, and, uh, it was fascinating to hear other people talking in the tournaments about not seeing any fish. And you were loaded up. You know, and we'd be getting, you know, 20, 30 shots a we day. We had no ch- After I yeah. talked to Croca, I said, we got second three times in the spring fly. No wonder we couldn't win that damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, p- people would ask me, like, how do you strip? Like, they'd be in a, in a major tournament, and I'd have people say, how do you strip the fly? And, I, you know, I, that's something I really didn't want to talk about at that time because— it was different. It was way different than. And you kind um, of unlocked a code a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, p- people who bonefish in other countries and and uh, or even in Key West and that. I mean, it was long strip, you know, move the fly. I mean, those fish are eating minnows, and so. So how did you do it? So, um, I you know I always fish the heaviest weighted fly possible for the conditions. That was kind of a golden rule, you know. And, and I was psychotic about the weight of the fly. Um, you know, I would have, I would keep three or four of the same fly of different weights in my pocket. I, you know, I'd have every single weight of 
of every pattern from no eyes to gigantic eyes um, and be changing constantly for the conditions. And then um, for these big fish, they don't like to, they don't like it moving. The big fish of that used to be here. There, there's still some, but um, so they like it on the bottom. They like it on the bottom. Sliding. S- s- no, not sliding. sliding. Quick bump. So quick short. You bumps. know, I, I heard Mark on the podcast. You know, talking a little bit about how I did it, and uh, you know, I would throw it, and I would watch for the fish's reaction. And when I knew he could see it, it would be boom. That's it. One bump. One bump. So so and and, and if he and typically that's what you got the bite when it was it bump back to the bottom. He, he would eat it, you know, tailing fish, the same thing. I would, I would not be moving it big, big tailors, big pair of tailors, throw it extremely close, wait till they came out of the tail, boom, like that, and then leave it. And they go over and tail on it while it's sitting there eating it, you know, they're eating it flat and just come tight. So I was going to ask when we had Jared on the podcast and he was explaining to us about, you know, his tactics with Mark Richens, Mm -hmm. they used to throw it. 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet away from the bonefish and just wait and just wait for the fish to get to the fly. So you didn't used to do that. Yeah. You had your own. Occasionally, if it, they were really like belly crawlers, really skinny and you didn't think, I, I, I know that I heard that podcast and that situation and those fish were in such skinny water and imagine slick calm. There was just no, not much of a prayer and he had an exit for those fish to come and they threw it out there and waited. I think that was the way to do it. For that for that occasion but most of our fish were not belly crawlers you know they were they were mutters or deep tailers and so and you, and your percentages go way way up you know the deeper the fish are the higher the percentages right so you know you got to deal with current you got to deal with all that stuff but it, you have to have the proper amount of weight on the fly nathaniel talked a lot about that about yeah, he would you know weigh he's his weighing plans. them now I, you know i didn't have a scale and i didn't do that um but how, we, how we were kind you, of thinking alike. Yeah. Uh, how could you tell if the fish or if your fly was not heavy enough? Well, it was immediate. Whenever I would see the fish uh, come up, it was over. On, on the big downtown weight fish especially, when you would see the fish rise up, you, you're not going to ever get the bite. Uh, it was over. And the fly was With too With the light. flies that I was using. I know um, Tim Klein and Carl Hyacin had a way different technique than, than we used. They used more of a stripping fly and they caught big fish. Um, they caught a lot of nine, 10 pounders, you know, in those tournaments and won a lot of tournaments. Uh, totally different technique, colored line, you know, everything different than us. But when I would strip, you know, have a shot and it would drive me insane. It was, you know, it still drives me insane thinking about it. But, you know, you get a perfect shot of mutters and you throw it and make the perfect shot and you make the strip and you see the fish rise up and be like, oh my God wrong weight and i'd be and i would immediately change right after that that shot so would you wait for the bonefish to tail on your fly is mm-hmm. that when you knew he ate yeah. it and that's when you yeah, if they set? were in a tailing situation yeah you know it's interesting um i hadn't really fished for very many permit when i was fishing the dale brown and uh, i fished it only that one time and i remember kilpatrick before the tournament i'd caught a handful of fish, but not very many. But I remember talking to Dale, or uh, Doug Kilpatrick about when do you set the hook when a permit is tailing and he eats your fly. He says, interesting, a lot of times you'll see a permit or a fish tip up on your fly, but they haven't eaten until you see that tail kick because yeah. they're, they're <clears throat> pinning it. And so in the tournament, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm fishing through Doug Kilpatrick's mouth, words. I throw this fly out and this permit tips up on it and I wait. I don't know how I could wait because I'm so damn hyper anyway. <laughs> and I see the permit's tail, you know, kick like that. I strip struck and I got him. I go, thank you. Thank you, Kilpatrick, <laughs> you so very much. But I think a lot of people, you know, will go periodically bone fishing or tarpon fishing. And every time they go, they might only have three or five days of fishing and they've waited the entire week or the entire year to get there to fish that one week. And these nuances that we're speaking about are very helpful for somebody to think ahead about, okay, I remember seeing that. And two, I remember on Shell Key, big downtown bonefish, I'd have a fly and I'd be stripping and stripping and it'd be a tailing fish and he'd be chasing it, chasing it. All I had to do was just drop it and he was going to eat it. 
And I was too damn hyper. I'd keep struggling. Eat, eat. And, I'd go, ah. and all of a sudden, he'd go, no, no, no come back. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah I, I, those situations stop. You just stop. And typically, you get to eat. But a lot of times, they'll stop. And you have to still hesitate. Give them a little time. And then one bump, boop, like that. Would you wait to see that tail dig it? Yeah. Or you just kind of feel it? Well, if they tail. But bonefish, unlike permit, they don't. They don't go up like this and look at it. They rarely do that. You know, you know how permit will, right. they'll, uh, you know, like maybe, maybe not. What is that? Is there a hook in there? You know, right. Uh, the, the big bonefish, they really don't do that. They, when they tip up, they're either going to eat it or, or refuse it. And they, when they eat it, they would go down and then they do this wag thing. Right. You know, and it'd be making a noise. Would and, you slide your fly at that point to hook them? Yeah. Strip strike. Just, right. and I would do it because in case they didn't have it. But I, right. but I always hesitated. Even when they were eating it, it wasn't immediate like it's this. It's like a drop back. Let them, exactly. <laughs> Let them suck it down a little bit. Right. right. Like a drop back and just, you know, and then it's, and then come tight like that. Yeah, it's really reading the fish's behavior and one to come tight to the fish. Yeah, it really is. Because it's not, you, you can't see them. Yeah, a lot of times you can. You can see their mouth open and, and eat it? Some, sometimes. Really? Yeah, when in really good light, um, really, especially like a dark backdrop. For mudding fish, I mean, I've seen them, like big bone fish, open their mouth and eat the fly. Really? Yeah. Yeah, you sure can. One of the interesting things that that Harry Spear taught me, and and he'd been around for so long, I was so fortunate to have him as a mentor for the years I had, and it was kind of of weird in the fact that he invited me to fish these two tournaments. I fished three. I fished the spring fly, the fall fly, and my first gold cup, and then he was gone. But he taught me so much about how to get a fly into position, a fly that's out of position. So let's just say hypothetically you're tarpon fishing and your fly is a little bit too far to the outside, right? And if you wait too long and start stripping, and it's going to attack the fish's eye, which is, you know, obviously no good. But two, he was saying instead of strip the fly into alignment with the tarpon, slide your rod tip. Mm-hmm. And I remember we were fishing in a bonefish tournament in Boot Keys. First time I'd seen this, we had some mudding fish. And I threw my fly out there, and the fish had turned. And, and Harry, we used to always say, don't strip it in, slide it in. So, again, you just slide the rod tip and then pick up your slack. Was that something that you guys used to reposition a fly? Not really. I, I would use um, just stripping. So if the fly was out of position, I, I might long strip it and then drop it right and then let it let it sit there but but how about in the world of tarpon fishing Same yeah too, yeah strip it yeah yeah but, that's it's interesting you know with with clear line though with uh, you know i went to all clear line fishing in 1999 for a long time ago yeah well, be- monic tropical fly lines in, in 1999 um Cro- via croca he he said that you know you have to go clear line. And, was and so, that because of the line in the air, the false casting? I don't think because so. You're, you're I think the there's fish is out there coming. How is he going to see a colored line? I, I don't think it's that. I think it's it's the it's angle shots primarily. You know, when the lines in the water and angle shots, it gives you. I used to say it gives you an extra fish a day, right? Or you know, maybe give in a tournament it might give you one important even, fish even, even a half a fish a day yeah overall. i mean that that i mean that's a winning combination right and right. so it, you know fish that are going away like big you know double digit mudding fish or tailing fish angling or quartering away from you that's an impossible almost an impossible shot with colored line you know you can right. do a reach cast and and uh, but they're gonna doing, see it. doing a reach cast with clear line and a long leader those are possible shots right and I, I just think it's, you know, it was a huge advantage. Nobody was using clear, nobody, except me, I think. Are the current then. tournament guys using all clear line now for bonefish tournaments? I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not current on that. I, I know a lot of people went to it. Right. You know, I, I went to that for everything but tarpon back then. Right. And then, and then probably in the mid-2000s, I started carrying a one clear in my tarpon. You know, f- four so. rod setup. <clears throat> you know where I notice a clear fly line really works well is in smaller fish, maybe in the Bahamas. I noticed that when Nikki, you and I went to Las Rocas in, in Venezuela, you'd have a group of, of bonefish coming. And if by chance they get past your fly, 
Now with a clear fly line, you can hook a fish in the back of the school. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, if you had a colored fly line, they get past your fly, they see that color and they blow. Yeah, and a lot of guides say, well, they don't like it for their clients because they can't see the line, right? They can't direct. And for, I, I get that for tarpon, I really do. I, right. And I'm, I'm kind of the same way with, with clients when I would guide, I, I kind of like the, the color line as well. It's a lot easier to help them. And, you, and it's also, also the leads are typically a lot greater and you can slide the fly in there and get it in the right position. Right. But with everything else, I, I like clear line, even for, for client fishing. But, uh, but, but I think it, it gives them, when they screw up, it, it, it helps, right? Mm -hmm. If they throw it over the, the fish. Right. That's what I was going to say. Early in the morning when they're blooping and there may be, you might see one roll and there may right. be 20 fish, that clear line can be advantageous. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I asked Kroka um, what advice he would ever give you, you know, when you guys were winning. He'd say, I, I wouldn't say a goddamn thing. <laughs> I'd say there they are, and you'd fuck. He said your casting was not the most beautiful. It was kind of open, maybe a little bit slower. But he'd say the damn bug would land right where it was supposed to be, and he'd be tight. Yeah, well, he's he. I learned a lot from Mark. He's and, very humble, as and, are you. And so Mark's, um, he's probably right in that he wouldn't be overtly teaching, but he would be teaching through, uh, through other ways, right. Um, not by exact, oh, this is what you did. Now, you know, the reverse of that is I want, when all my tournament fishing, I analyzed every shot and I wanted the guide feedback on every single shot. Right. You know, and I what do you to, think? I used to say, you know, there's mental mistakes and physical mistakes. And, you know, we, it got to the point where Murphy would say to me, was that mental or physical? You know, did you really mean to do that? You, you know, hit, no. that, hit that tarpon on the head. Did you, is that really what? <laughs> Meaning, you know, did you think that that was where you should be or, was or did you, it was a bad cast? Right, right, right. So that, that's how I distinguish between the two. And I want, I analyzed every single shot. Okay, that was a physical mistake. I, I just didn't make the cast. I screwed up, right? Uh, or I saw it this way, Rick. What do you, how'd you see it? You know, and Mark and I and Dwayne and I would, we all talk those situations through. And I think. Doing that miss makes you so much better. For sure. Well, you, you have, have two eyeballs and two assessments. Yeah. You got to understand your own uh, capabilities and your own faults and, you know, understand that you screw up. I mean, I wasn't, you're right. I'm, uh, and Mark's right. I, for my bone fishing and permit fishing and whatnot, I, I throw a pretty open loop purposely. Because you don't want to hit hard. I want it to land soft. Right. That's right. And yeah. an open loop allows that fly to turn over softly. Yeah. Um, it's also too, it's almost like a caddy and a golfer. A caddy can read a yeah. putt. Like if you just go to a, a new golf course and pick up a new caddy to play that round of golf and the, and the caddy will say well, it's right edge or it's a ball out. But that caddy doesn't know how hard that golfer hits his putts. Or he may say hit it 50%. It's like, what's 50% well, when you don't know 100%? Well, right. no, well here, no, here's the difference. You don't know what 50% is if you don't know the speed of the ball coming what, off that putter. That's what I said. You don't know, 100, you don't know what my normal what putting stroke putting, is, so yeah. what's 50%? Yeah. yeah. And also, too, it's like, you know, when you're fishing with, when you fish around the world, I get so friggin' aggravated because the guides that we have fished with our entire life down here in the Keys are the best in the world. And you go elsewhere and they say something or they pull the boat differently or they don't chase fish. You hook a nice big fish, they don't pull it down, they don't, won't go after it. Um, so I think that like a lot of times, um, you, we have to know ourselves. The more you fish, the more you can rely on your own ability to feed, to cast, to lead, and to catch that fish. Because when you go to somewhere else, Sure, I always ask them, what do you think? Because those fish might want to react a little bit differently than our fish. But the more you fish with a guide like you and, and Murphy and you and Croca and you and Dwayne Baker, you become a team. And you become a well-oiled you know, team. And there's nothing better than that. Then you get on the water, there they are. Yeah. That's all they say. It, you got them? I think it was a huge advantage for me going through those years that uh, you know, I started with Dwayne for the fall added mark and then for the spring and then added rick murphy for the backcountry tournaments and the tarpon tournaments and stuck with those guys right i i didn't 
I didn't really fish with a lot of guides. You know, I fished with Eric and fun stuff and a couple backcountry tournaments. And, and I've had the opportunity to fish with other guides through like my company tournament and things. But from a competitive standpoint, it was really three guys. Right. And that was it. And you create um, a language and an know, understanding. You do. You understand each other's weaknesses and you understand when to be quiet. Uh, you know, Rick would, if I screwed up, he would just turn around, give me the cold, he called it the cold bum, you know, just turn around, fold his arms and look the other way for a minute and gather his breath. And, um, you know, Mark, I could just hear the sighing, Ugh. but he would, you know, and I fished with Mark with a lot of people and Mark's, uh, Mark is funny as, as all get out, he you is. know, on some of his comments about, you know, well, 60 feet to the left of where you just, you know, stuck, you know that was the was, fish you wanted to catch. It was in a different zip code, you know, <laughs> yeah. maybe he's over there, you know, there's all kinds of funny things that he would say, but he never did that with me. Yeah. Um, we, we, we didn't just have had to. so much trust in each other. Right. We didn't, you Sometimes didn't you just make a mistake. And then fishing with Dwayne, Dwayne's the ultimate positive guy, you know, and it drive, it would drive me nuts because you wanted some feedback. I sucked, Dwayne. That was a terrible, that was the, it was horrible. And he'd be like, that's okay. We'll get the next one. You know, it's all right. You know, always positive. I'm, Nurse feel good. Yes. <laughs> drive, drive me, no, criticize me. Please throw the pole yeah. at me. Yeah, but no, but that's how you learn. You know, yeah. and, and I think a lot of people, they don't get better because they're not willing to listen. They're too defensive. Right. They may have a lot of money. They may have a big house in New York, but they suck in the bow. Yeah. So the, you got to put the ego aside and figure out how to cast into a wind. And it's like you have all these guys that we've had in the past from the West come to, to fish out here. And there's not that many because I don't say, okay, come fish anymore. Because the last thing you want to do is spend a week pulling your boat for somebody who can't fucking throw the, the fly in right. the wind. Uh, so, so how did you get over that hump from just entering these prestigious tournaments to being successful and, and to start winning them? Was there, is there something that you, that you learned or what happened that you got over that hump and you just started winning? Well, um, or was it just time? I, you know, I grew up, I started fly fishing when I was five, uh, five or th four or five. And, uh, you know, could really handle a fly rod by six or seven years old. And so, and I fished hard my whole life, whether it be trout or steelhead or, you, you, you grew know. up in the Great Lakes area, No, I right? grew up in Pennsylvania. Oh, Pennsylvania, yeah, okay. Yeah, fishing with my grandfather, and, you know, we just went from season to season, kind of like you guys do, and the West. just, you know, fished hard and hunted hard. And um, so when I came down here, my first day was with Dwayne Baker ever fishing down here in 1990. And uh, we went out, and it was blowing about 25, and I thought he would cancel, and it was bright sunny, and he showed up at the dock. He said, let's go. And I caught five bonefish up in Key Largo that day, and and uh, I was hooked, man. I mean, I was hooked, and you know, so I just I fished hard, fished a lot. I was I was fishing eighty days a year for a guy that's, that's a working, lot. A guy's oh. working and has family. That's that's a lot of days. Um, I would, you know, when I first started tournament fishing, I started scheduling out the whole year of my practice schedule. So as I kept adding tournaments. I would add the practice days for those tournaments around the tides. So, you know, I would fish probably uh, 12 or 14 days with Rick throughout the year and then kind of build up before the tarpon tournament, you know, and particularly two weeks before around the tides, I would fish six or seven days with both Mark and, and Dwayne uh, around the tides that we were going to have for the tournament to practice on those tides. And, uh, you know, so how do you how do you get over the hump? You just, I think, keep working, keep practicing, keep participating, and and you know, I won my first major in um, 2000 with Dwayne, the, the fall fly. And it was, it seems like a blur, like you know that that tournament. It you know from there to winning a a lot of them, it that was really kind of just it just happened, right? The first tournament you probably remember the first serious tournament you won it's like wow how did that happen it's well, it never was, happened again for me it was <laughs> only one 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 fish tournament well you won but, a lot of tournaments though. yeah and but i know what you're i remember saying. we went to Murata bay and had those big giant colored drinks and 
in 2000 and I, it's like I was in a daze. Like I couldn't, I couldn't believe it until, you know, a couple of years later where it kind of becomes expected. Like, you know, Demanding why did yourself. I lose? Right. Why, why didn't, you know, and you know, the tournaments, I think you would agree with this were, they're painful, right? That's, that's, it's painful work. And, um, you, if you don't win, it's even more painful. Right. Um, it's and fun when you when they hand you the trophy. It, that, yeah, I used to say that's the only time that they're fun. Right. Otherwise, I agree. I really didn't do it for the social. I know so a lot of guys come down; they love it. It's a week and it's fun and social, and you know, I didn't do it for that. I did it to to, to win. win, and right. That's the way those guides were. All the all those guides were they weren't playing. They were it was they weren't doing it for the check. They were to a certain degree, but they were doing it for the to win right no i get that highly competitive let's talk about briefly about uh about croca's clairvoyance because <laughs> i think he had a great impact on the podcast talking about how he would predict things and see things before they actually happen and he was talking about i asked him when he first saw something before it happened and then it happened he said when i was very young and he realized soon thereafter that no one else were were seeing things that actually took place later after he visualized them. But he talks about this story about the spotted eagle ray. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about that. The, I mean, well, I, I, that's it, just fascinating. To I'm me. sure the reaction from your audience was like, wow, all that, cause that, that, that was a lot in there. I thought it was great. Yes. That, that podcast. And there was really a lot of, of things in there that are odd that I'm sure people were like, really, is that, or is that just BS, you know? And those are things I took for granted because after getting to know Mark, you know, I really just believe <laughs> right? Right. In, in supernatural I, things. I just believe, you know, I, I mean, you know, like I, it, what he, when he says, I, I think I told you this, when he says it, it you know, it's considered to be the truth. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't kid about those things. And, um, and so, you know, I know about, you know, the lights that he would see and, on his way to Flamingo, and and uh, and I believe him, a hundred percent. I think he has supernatural connection, and I don't know what all that is, but I can tell you that that spotted eagle ray story was uh, was unbelievable. Um, you know, I show up at Crandon, and uh, you know, he says, Tim, I just want you to know that something's going to happen today, and you know, it might be bad, and it's involving a spotted eagle ray. Now, at 5 in the morning or 5.30 in the morning when somebody says that to you at the boat ramp, you know. You probably didn't really hear it that very no, clearly I, because it's early, you're tired. Yeah, right. Yeah, and and and, and I believed. That's the point. So I did mean, you get scared at that point? No, I was just thinking, okay, when is this going to happen? You know, because Mark's, Mark knows it's going to happen, and so it, thus it's going to happen. You know, and I hope I don't get, you know, stabbed in the heart. <laughs> But when it happens. And so we're on the backside of Elliot and it was high tide and there was, you know, it was low light and there wasn't a lot we could really do at that, that, that early light. Mark liked to go early and I always had to say, ah, I don't want to go that early. You right. Know, I'm a fly fisherman. And uh, so we're pulling down this kind of deep water edge and uh, looking for permit at that time. And, and, uh, and sure enough, the damn spotted eagle right jumps out of the water over my rod and like, I mean, has that ever happened to you? No, especially no. when somebody called it before it happens. Babe Ruth, right? right? I mean, yeah. no, it's, it's, it's better than that. It's, he knew it was happening and uh, jumps right over my rod. And, uh, and I just stood there like kind of taking it all in. And I just hear this. I'm glad that's over with. Crazy. From the back of the boat. And, you know. I just let that sink in for a while because that's a, that's an, a unique ability, but I think it translates to uh, a lot about Mark and his, you know, he never had a GPS on his boat. Uh, you know, he never looked at a tide chart. He would fish from Biscayne Bay to Key West and, and he had it all here, you know, um, he, we won, I think I told you the story, not, I don't think it was in the podcast, but one of the spring flies that we want, we pull into the gas station by Bud and Mary's and uh, we go in and 
and uh, he had a pair of sunglasses on. And you know those flying fisherman displays sure, yeah, that show yeah. the polarized thing, you know? So he, he we pull in, he looks, and he takes it off, and then he grabs a pair off the thing, and he looks, and, and he hands it to me. He goes, Tim, look at this. And I can see I, the fish with these glasses on. Yeah, but I, you couldn't with the glasses that he wore for three days to, want, to win one of the toughest tournaments in our sport. Not even polarized. He didn't have polarized sunglasses on for three days. And, you know, I mean, we just... Yeah, you know, he saw everything. It's, it's remarkable, right? So, unbelievable. He's a, he's a very, very special person and uh, a person, a special person. He is. And a, yeah, no, a, I, a, I totally agree. In a you. guide standpoint, uh, out of this world. Yeah. Unique. How did you? What? What? What took place to have you move on out of the tournaments? Um, Why did you quit? So I won. The Golden Fly, that, that completed. That was 2007. So we won the Gold Cup in six. And then I moved to the Golden Fly in seven and won that. And then, um, and then you know, I kind of had done everything. It's kind of where I was. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I had um, young girls and uh, young, yeah, two, two at that point, a, a little baby and um, I had just kind of accomplished everything I wanted to do. And, you know, it was still, a, it's a financial drag and, and, uh, time, time. And I wanted to recommit to, to my family and, and, uh, kind of just was done, you know? Right. Um, and you know, that went for a few years and, and I missed it. Uh, I just missed be, having a reason to be on the water and I still do really. Um, you know, it's not like having a practice schedule and intensity and, and tournaments to look forward to was really reason to fish, you know, really reason to get out there. And it's, it is definitely, uh, different, just fun fishing for me. It's just, it's just different. So that's why I went and got my guide's license is I just wanted to have that uh, something else to give me the juice, mm -hmm. you know, to give me the, the, the drive. Cause you I love to, I love to win again. But with somebody else in the bow, yeah. if you wanted a tournament fish, and you you did fish the fall fly recently and caught the biggest fish and got second, had a chance to win. I fished was it. Was that a similar juice? Yeah, it was. I mean, I fished it. I've really tried to avoid it, um, tournament fishing. I just, because I really wanted it to be, you Organic. know, very part-time and fun. Right. Um, you know, and I did that uh, quite a bit from, say, like uh, 2011 to 2015. Um, you know, I did it quite a, quite a bit of guiding, weekend guiding, vacation guiding. Um, and I really tried to avoid the tournaments, but I loved it. I, you know, I got the ch chance to meet and, uh, fish with people that I knew, but, or, you know, people that I thought about fishing with, but never did before. So I spent a lot of time with Glenn Flutie on the bow and, you know, I've, I've seen David Delu fish on my bow and, and then Rick started booking me, Rick Murphy. So we did this for, I started getting my money back, <laughs> which is, I'm still in the hole, but, yeah, for sure. but, uh, but that was, so it was a lot of fun to, and Heidi and Paul nude and, and, and then you uh, caught a big record with Heidi. So that must've really got your finger stuck in the, in the light socket for a little bit. Yeah, that was, um, I mean, but how long were you chasing that record? So, so tell me about the record. I, you know, here you go out with Heidi, you got caught a world record women's tarpon fish or a record which is enormous yeah so um paul and, and heidi and i had fished together we're we're friends first and then and and my wife as well and uh and we had fished done some fishing and i had guided them some but heidi had been going for this record uh the 12 pound record for about four years she was fishing primarily with rob and uh, they had they had hooked 10 or 12 and fought 10 or 12 uh, fish and broke them all off over a four year time frame. Had them right a couple of times right to the boat and, and, uh, you know, didn't get, get the opportunity to stick them. So, um, we were, it was February day, uh, 2014 and they booked me. It was beautiful weather. And, uh, I, you know, I wasn't even thinking about record fishing. 
Especially for at, a tar- with the tarpon yeah. we were around, right? It was a tarpon day. It was, yeah. you know, I knew it was a tarpon day, and that was what we, that's all we brought. We brought 12 weights, 10, right. 10 or 11 weights and 12 weights. And, and, uh, but when I picked them up at the dock, they showed up with Billy Pate's gaff that they had bought it at, uh, at the, his auction. And Craig Brewer had, had redone the handle on the gaff, and it was this monster gaff. And, and I've never gaffed a tarpon. Um, I've hardly gaffed any fish at all. Um, and uh, I'm like, oh, great. And she threw me a couple spools of 12 pound. And I'm like, okay, let's go. So, so we took off and we get out in the middle of the bay and, and it's the first spot and I stake off. And, and so I whip up a leader. I like, you know, barely awake, you know, and I whip up a leader and, and uh, one bimini. And I do a double overhand and I tie like, I think 50 to it, you know, 50 shock, maybe might've been 60 and, uh, put it on her rod and, and Paul grabs his rod and he starts to fish. And the first spot, you know, we, we had a couple shots and he catches one would have been the record and it catches like a hundred pounder. What, what size fish do you need? Well, I think at the time it was like 87. It was, it was pretty small. Right. It was very, very doable. Right. And, uh, and Paul catches a really nice one would have been, ah, but that's the way they fished. They alternated, they, they alternated, they split the days. They, it wasn't about Heidi trying to get this fish. And, and, uh, so we go to the next spot and, uh, and the place was loaded and it was fallen tide and it was fish were, they're all big and we jumped a couple fish and, and, uh, kind of running out of tide. And, uh, you know, the, the fish were like in maybe say three to four feet of water out to about eight feet of water. And I kept going in and out and I'm, I'm pulling out to deep again. And I just had a feeling, I'm like, maybe there's one more big one back inside. So I turned the boat around, I push up in there and there she was laying. And Heidi, um, you know, you've seen her on TV fishing with Rob and Silver King. She's, she's a really great angler. I mean, she's, you know, if not the best lady ang- tarpon angler, she's certainly right up there. She's won the tournaments, the lady tournament four times, and um, she can, she can get it done. And uh, she, uh, the fish was laying there. She threw it, bloop, right right in front, two strips, and that big girl just, bloop, you know, and three major jumps out of the mud, and I go, that's the one, you know, and. Uh, we take off after him and she fights this fish for, well, she doesn't fight it. We follow it for four, 40 minutes. It just wouldn't do anything. Never, wouldn't, never jumped after that, just following it out in the basin. And Heidi turned to me and she gets said, am I doing something wrong? I mean, you know, should I pull? And I said, no, when the fish stops and gives you a little bit, then we'll fight the fish. And it was just a couple minutes later, the fish stopped and kind of turned sideways and she pulled and he, she came back and I said, okay, let's get on it. And we got right up on that fish and she pulled on that fish for the next 10 minutes. Like you wouldn't believe on on 12. And, um, uh, we, we got the fish right in front of the bow and Paul, her husband screaming at me, gaff him, gaff him. And, I, and if you've ever looked at no, him, you gaff him. Yeah. You want to, <laughs> you want to go, you want to go for a swim? You gaff him, right? So well, you hear all I these had, old stories about old man in the sea getting pulled over the boat, right? Well, it was clearly in the back of my mind. So I was that was the fittest I ever was in my life. I had I had started CrossFit probably a couple of years before that, and I was really, and I was really yoked for this moment. I mean, I was just, you know, and I wasn't going to get pulled in for doing something stupid. And I, and, I, and I think that there was a <laughs> that's what they all say. <laughs> yeah. Well, I if you gaff a fish and you're standing on the bow and you're not. You're not going to have your leverage. You're going you're, swimming. You're going swimming. There's yep. no, yeah. I don't know how you wouldn't, you know, who, no matter who you are, yeah. you can be Rob Fordyce. You're probably going to get pulled in. Right. So, um, he was screaming at me to gaff him. I said, shut up, Paul, <laughs> you know, just calm down. And, and, um, uh, you know, so the fish, and I, I think I had read an article, Steve Huff, it might've been Monty's article in, uh, Garden and Gun. Flies or Garden, 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 yes. Garden, yeah. I think he talked about that being pulled in. So I had that in my mind. I knew I'd, I'd read or heard Steve talk about that. So I, you know, again, I had never seen it done, but I had it, I had exactly what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. 
And what I wanted to do was through the top of the back, one stroke and into the boat. And I didn't care about the fiberglass, you know, the, the gaff is going into the boat. You get, so you're going to pin her up against the, the gunnel. Right across the top of the back. Pin and, her against the gunnel. And in a gunnel. In yeah. one motion. In one motion. And, you know, I just was patient and we waited and, and I got her, finally got her to the side and got the shot and it was one shot. And, and uh, the funny part there was Paul was, get her in, get her in the boat, you know, get her in the boat, like panicking. I'm like, hmm, calm down. I coached Heidi, you know, rele- release your drag, let some line out. And Paul, and I got Paul to grab the lip gaff and we got her in the boat. Good for you. Yeah. And how big is that fish? 154? 152.8, you know. On 12. Uh, no, it over, it she over tested. Yes. 16. So she bumped Diana's 135, Diana Rudolph's 135 out and, and took the 16 record. Right. What's the side of your boat look like? It was just a little hole. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to tell you the, the story, the backstory that, that I'll tell the public now uh, that nobody, only a few select people know is, you know, I couldn't enjoy that moment because as soon as we got her in the boat, I mean, I knew, obviously, we strapped it. I'm like, it was, we strapped it at 148, I think. So I'm like, oh, we're good. But I immediately thought of the leader and the fact that. The configuration of IGFA length. Yeah. Shock. I mean, I, I knew the rules. I tied it right. I measured once, though. And, you know, I think most people that are record fishing do it on their dining room table and they measure three times and you, you're meticulous, right? Like a I mean, scientist. It's like yeah. you're doing it in a tournament. Sure. You're, you're meticulous about your, your leaders. And this was done. It was blowing. And you were hung over I'm, on the, I'm over hung the over. console. I was. <laughs> I, was hung, morning. I was hung over. How do you know that? <laughs> I mean, I'm hung over and it just, you know. So I was sick at my stomach that whole ride back. And uh, we get to Worldwide and, you know, there was 100 people there because Paul had called everybody. And there was literally 100 people there gathered. And they had to bring a forklift out because the fish broke the tree that they typically use to hang it. And uh, then we, that's, we can't, you know, we got the picture on a forklift, but I just couldn't, I, I couldn't enjoy it. Cause I, I was just so concerned that I had screwed that up and imagine. You had killed a fish with a kill, leader that was killed not- fish. You got, you know, one of your really good friends would have been horrific. The embarrassment for me would have been pretty bad. Needless right. to say. And uh, so, Jenny and I went to Ziggy's and Paul and Heidi, I forget why we didn't work together, but they went to, I think Chef Michael's and he called me, they were, we were in the middle of dessert and he called me and they were celebrating. And I wasn't celebrating, I, I could hardly even eat. I, could, I probably couldn't have eaten a shoe. You still didn't know. Second guessing yourself. I was second guessing myself and, and uh, Paul says, uh, are you celebrating? I said, no, man, did you measure the leader by chance? He says, yeah, only five times. <laughs> <laughs> Now you can celebrate. <laughs> yeah, I, he said you were just spot on. Wow. So, and then I celebrated. Oh, good for you. Yeah. I mean, um, it was a big moment. Yeah, for, no, for, for sure. I mean, and also too, I mean, you've 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 come full circle too in that you know you were an angler uh, as a young man, you know, very passionate. You hit a huge home run and many home runs at a Shea Stadium, and now you have a passion for guiding and and and, and maybe. Evol- evolving into the tournament scene. I don't know if you, how much more of that you'll do, but you cut this monster world record with this woman. I mean, you have the full repertoire. You know, you can guide, you can fish, you can do it all at the, at the highest of levels. You know, when you take a step back, you know, you must feel pretty complete. Yeah, it, it feels, uh, I, I was mentioning this to you earlier that, you know, catching that record with Heidi feels uh, like I didn't almost deserve it. You know, I, I, I did from, you know, getting her in the position and doing the right things, but I didn't put in the time, you know, like Rob did with her, like, like, you know, like hearing Tom Evans put in that sweat and the pain, uh, the pain, it was go out, tie one leader, go catch a fish, the biggest fish ever caught by a lady angler ever and go home and weigh it. And that was, great it's 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 just strange that it happened uh, in a in a way uh, i feel very fortunate and happy for her uh, but yeah my um there's not a lot 
that I want to accomplish. You know, I want to have fun. Um, you know, I've got girls that like to fish, but they don't, they're not crazy about it. They, uh, they go out and they catch a bunch of fish and they go, okay, what are we doing next? And, right. you know, we, so. What's, uh, so how does it feel like now you spent all that time, all those years in the game's biggest arena with these big downtown bonefish in Isla Mirada. And we've spoken about this on the podcast in the past, and we're going to speak with Dale Perez tomorrow a little bit, that monster fish he caught. But this, this stadium, if you will, is now like a, like a playground instead of, what it once was how does that do how does that affect you and your daily approach to being the bone fisherman that that you've been your entire life so passionate about the big fish yeah it's it's something i can't replace um you know the bone fishing is in a way really good it really is really really good now still yeah for smaller fish and it's and, and and I think it's getting better. I think everybody you would talk to said would say over the last two three years it keeps getting better. You know, there's hope that those big fish will they'll grow up and they'll be big again. Right. I, I don't know that that's true. I think they could be different genetics, a different genetic fish. So for me, I mean, it's um, it's hard to get over it. You know, as I drive by those spots, I remember. I I, re, I do. I think about it all the time. I can't get it. I can't block it. I think. As I'm driving by spots, I think about very specific moments in tournaments, very specific fish, and I can't block it. You know, it doesn't matter how many fish are there now. You know, those being able to see 14, 15 pound bonefish every day or most every day, um, that's just something that was a very, really special thing, really unique to us here. And, and uh, we might not get it back. Yeah, you know, you, you know, gotta accept it. But yeah, I I get that, and and it comes it comes home to me when we were speaking with Al Fluger the other day. He's eighty three years old. He's on his last chapter, if you will. He can't move. Fell, hit his head. He's at home. He's downsizing. And I asked him, you know, towards the end of the podcast, I said, "How do you feel with where you're at right now? You know, you're eighty three. We had COVID." You know, you're not doing as well as you once did, but you're still, you're still here. What do you think? He said, he smiled and he said, I've had a big life. <laughs> he said, I got great, great, great memories. I have done so many great things. So he's living vicariously through what he did all those years. Like we are as bone fishermen now and as tarpon fishermen, we know what we caught out there. We know what we saw. And he said, every morning I wake up, I take a photograph of the sunrise and it's the greatest day of my life. <laughs> it's pretty cool. That's Al. You know, and that's Al. But yeah. that's too, as fishermen, that's what we know. That's what we saw. And look at our tarpon fishing is still great. Yeah, for our sure. Our backcountry fishing, you know, obviously goes like this and it always has. Yeah. Uh, but it's still great. Yeah, uh, for sure. The baby tarpon fishing, the bone fishing. So it's not uh, end of the world. But no, there, there's just a, there is a piece that potentially is gone, you know, forever. And it is what it is. I, I look at the, you know, the moments and the memories around the house and, and I drive by those spots and, and it's, it's not bad. Right. It's just not, it's just gone. Our girlfriends got a little older. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Timmy, it's great having you. I've yeah. always appreciated you know, the rivalry that you have had and applied to these tournaments. You dominated for so many years and, you know, there's so much respect uh, that is well deserved. Yeah. And hats off to you, bud. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Nikki, uh, you asked the question where you guys did you have animosity? And, you know, I never really got the answer to that. But the answer is no. I, I, for me, it was total respect. You know, um, we didn't really talk yeah. during those, but it was just total respect. And, and for a while, you were kicking my butt. And for a while, that went the other way. So right. it was. It's good times. It good was to, the best. Good to get to know you better. For sure. Yeah. Great Thanks. to meet you, Tim. Yeah, same. Thanks, dog. <laughs> Thanks, man. When I saw his best side story.